I'm talking about Pope Francis, and some of the things he says make for very difficult questions. So I wanted a movable mic so I can go hide if you ask a really hard question. Um, uh, and if I, or just refer you to his uh, communications arm of the Vatican. Uh, it's great to be back in Denver, uh, in Colorado, uh, up in Fort Collins when I ran Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Denver, it included the mission here in town, uh, near and dear to my heart. It was one of the few places you could go and really encounter Christ in the face of those in need and then go get a good beer afterwards <laughs> right across the street. So uh, it really a, a, a wonderful sort of, Fort Collins knows how to do things. Um, uh, delighted to be here. I am uh, uh, work for the, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I just want to explain that briefly. The Bishops Conference is the National Conference of Bishops. It started in 1917, so we're coming up on 100 years. It was originally founded around the time of the First World War as the bishops' effort to sort of create a national Catholic response to the war, response being to help out, frankly, to provide services and make sure they could be, use the parishes to do good things to particularly help refugees, et cetera. Um, and it's, con it's perdured since then. Uh, the way the conference works is it's broken into various committees. The bishops elect a committee head and they break various areas of responsibility. There's about 16 standing committees, roughly the kind that you might call pastoral and some that you might call uh, policy oriented and some do both. So a pastoral committee deals with liturgy or it deals with doctrine or it deals with Hispanic ministry. And then the policy ones deal with various areas. They can deal with pro-life issues, they can deal with immigration issues. And I oversee the committees, there's a couple committees that I staff or my team staffs and they have to do basically with those areas of justice, peace and human development. So everything from development in the United States to human development overseas. We work very closely with Catholic Relief Services, Catholic Charities USA, and a lot of other organizations, St. Vincent de Paul, all over the country. Um, we deal with questions uh, that everything from criminal justice reform uh, to uh, family stability in the inner city. So we just, we cover a lot of issues. We have a very, uh, an excellent team. I love the work. And it's a real gift. People ask, what do I like the most about the work? And I just want to share with you why I feel like I'm one of the most blessed men in the world, besides the fact that I married up and have seven beautiful children. That's why I'm the most blessed man in the world. Because if this is recorded and she hears about it, she is my, I want my wife to know. <laughs> um, because I forgot Valentine. I'm just kidding. Um, the great part, one of the great parts of my work, I love traveling around the country. Uh, I do a fair bit of speaking, but I also do a lot of visiting of some of the things observing a lot of the places that the Catholic Church is in many of its different manifestations and forms. Uh, on the border, on the other side of the border, I've been in drug cartel run cities in Mexico. Uh, I've been overseas to various places and seen mining, strip mining and various things in Latin America. I've been in a lot of major cities, just came from LA recently in the east side and seen some amazing things that the Catholic parish is doing on the east side of LA. Um, and I just want to say to you, to those of you who are in the room who are Catholic, I just want to say in a particular way to you, uh, the Catholic Church is doing some amazing things. They don't always make the news. The things that make the news tend to be more around current controversies and political questions. But all over the country, there are Catholic faithful doing amazing things that uh, every one of which would deeply move your heart and blow you away in terms of the kind of sacrifices people are making. And something to say about Pope Francis, who I love, who I've loved dearly as, as Pope and his teaching, and his visit to DC was, was pretty amazing, um, and New York and Philadelphia. Um, he's really touching something the church does extremely well when he talks about concern for the other, building a culture of encuentro. He's really touching something that's a real mark of what the church is. And it's a beauty that it's being lifted up, not just in the United States, but around the world. It was quite a profound experience when he came to the United States. We joke, we say the visit didn't end until the plane landed when he got back for obvious reasons. But um, the day after he was in DC, he gave his uh, speeches and spoke and he left, uh, was in, visited six different senators the day after he left, both sides of the aisle. 
And I just want to let you know that for one day, they all wanted to get along. It was beautiful. Uh, they changed after that day, and now we're back to where we were. Uh, so I went to D.C. three years ago and clearly haven't made it any better. So uh, I'm still working on it. So what is Pope Francis up to? I think it's a, it's a fair question to ask, and I don't mean specific things. I don't mean a, a sentence here or there or touching upon U.S. politics. I think contrary to what a lot of people in the United States might think, there are 6% of Catholics in the world live in the United States. 6% in the whole world live in the United States. So I, I don't think Pope Francis wakes up every morning wondering how the Catholic Church is doing in the United States or what's going on here. Uh, that's sometimes how we read him, though. Sometimes we want to read him. What, how does that affect us? Pope Francis has a very global view. Uh, I grew up in Latin America, so I know something of the, of the world uh, from which he comes. I was in Venezuela, not Argentina. And I want to try to express to you I think what is the broader vision, a couple of the key pieces of a vision behind Pope Francis, which is the application of what is commonly called Catholic social teaching to modern questions of human development, poverty, exclusion, et cetera. And I'm going to do that in three parts so that you know where I am in this and I make sure I move, move through it. And the narrative, after a bit of an introduction on Catholic social teaching, it's a little sidelight. The narrative I want to tell basically has three movements. And the first movement is called a culture of exclusion. The second movement is called a culture of encounter. And the third movement is called missionary discipleship. And I think this is sort of a way of explicating what Pope Francis is doing. Uh, and I'll make that argument as I go along, and we can fill in some of the details and have all kinds of questions as we do that. But first, a word on Catholic social teaching, uh, which is a commonly at least in Catholic spheres, we refer to this term a lot, uh, but a lot of people don't know what it means. There was a recent study done by some friends of mine at the Catholic University of America, which is across the street from where I work. And they did a survey asking Catholics what basic words meant, like solidarity, subsidiarity, common good, human dignity, these kinds of basic words that fall under Catholic social teaching. And they asked them, do you know what it means? And on different numbers, but I'm, I'm going to roughly put them all together. Roughly, the story was 70% of them say, sure, I know what that means. Then the next question was, okay, pick the correct definition out of a list. And the number who got the definition rate was like 20% on most of these words. And so there's, uh, there's a little bit of clarity we want to grab around this term Catholic social teaching, what we mean by it. And it's complex, and there's a lot of aspects to it. I want to boil it down to just a couple simple principles that make Catholic social teaching what it is. Number one. When the Catholic Church thinks and teaches about social development, society, what makes for a healthy society, it starts fundamentally with the question, what is a human being? What is it to be a human being? And in answering that question, it says a couple things that are important to note. First, it says that a human being is made in the image and likeness of God and therefore has what they call an inherent dignity. Now, everyone uses the word dignity. Everybody thinks it's a wonderful word. The Catholic Church goes a little further and says there's reasons why human beings have dignity. And there's three pieces to this reason. Number one, they have dignity because they were made in the image and likeness of God. And so every human being, just by virtue of their very existence, has a dignity and needs to be treated in a certain way. No one is expendable. No one is to be thrown away. Another one of great... Francis' great lines, a culture, a throwaway culture. No one is just for a transaction's sake. No one is to be used. They have an inherent dignity because they've been made in a particular way. Secondly, they have an inherent dignity because they've been redeemed, because God himself sent his son to die for them. So this elevates even more what a human being is. And thirdly, they have a dignity because they have a destiny, because they were made to be something, that they have a story to write as they become more and more the person they were made to be. And that person they were made to be is ultimately to be someone who is in intimate friendship with God himself, which means something transcendent. It's something bigger than just human accomplishment. So from a Catholic perspective, we would say you could become the president of the United States. Well, maybe we use a different analogy these days. Um, you could become the best golfer in the world, um, something you look up to. And I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Come on, relax. There's, a, there's no parking. Everyone relax. Right? We had wine. 
Um, some of you looked at President of the United States, global leader, whatever, and what the church would just simply say, that's great, but you were made for way more than that. As scripture says, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard what awaits those for whom God loves, whom God loves and is made for love. So there's a great dignity. So when we view a human being, we see them both as having an inherent dignity from the Catholic Church's perspective, but also a destiny. And so a lot of Catholic social teaching asks this fundamental question. What needs to be true in this human being's life for them personally, but also in terms of opportunity, access to basic things that will allow them to become the fullness of what they were made to be. So Catholic social teaching is concerned about things like every human being having clean water, every human being having access to education and basic health care. Why? Because their understanding isn't just we should give you stuff. The understanding is you were made for something extraordinary and these basic things are necessary for you to become that. It's fundamentally behind why Catholic social teaching cares about human freedom and religious freedom. Because every human being, part of their capacity is to be free, particularly in their encounter with God. And so the first thing you want to say is human beings are not just static things. They're things with this potential, and Catholic social teaching wants to see them achieve it. And their ultimate potential of union with God, and so in their religious life, they need freedom. They need to have the freedom to have that encounter with God. And so if you wonder, you know, why does the bishop say this, or why does the pope say that, or what's going on? Why do they care about things like, in, you know, whatever it is, environment, water, um, freedom, you know, why do they, abortion, why do they care about all these things? Because they care about human beings and understand them in a particular way. The second thing I want to say in general about what they mean by a human being is human beings, they also understand, were made for community. Human beings are social animals. We're made to be in communion. We're not isolated containers that go around and just satisfy needs, which is sometimes how we're treated legally and other reasons and economically. But the Catholic Church is always going to ask the question about the community in which human beings live. And you start in a community. You start in a community of a family. The babe knows the, recognizes mom's face, recognizes mom's laugh, recognizes dad's voice before the babe even knows that they have extension and existence in space. They, they, they're in relationship between they know that they exist themselves. It's just the nature of humanity. And so the Catholic Church is concerned about communities. It's concerned first and foremost about the family, not just the nuclear family, but the whole family. It's concerned about neighborhoods. It's concerned about social orders that extend from there. It's concerned about parish. It's concerned about the nation. It's concerned ultimately globally about what it calls a human family. Because fundamentally it views human beings as part of communities. So let me just cash this out for you in one example before we dive into Pope Francis. It means that when the Catholics look at a particular situation, a challenge, a problem, a question, they bring this lens. These are the glasses they put on. And let me give you one that uh, we've been talking about, and I've been there a number of times, and we've been working on some projects, in the city of Detroit. I grew up outside of Detroit. I have a, a passion for Detroit. If any of you know anything about Detroit or follow it a little bit, it's been through some rough times in the last while. Uh, the only city doing worse is probably Flint, Michigan, where I was born. But anyway, <laughs> Detroit is in rough shape, and people are trying to figure out what to do there. Well, one of the challenges, one of the many challenges Detroit faces, Detroit is 144 square miles. Detroit's population went from roughly 1.6 million, I think, to down to 700,000, or 1.4 million to 700,000 in a period of about 20 years, 25 years. You can't do that to a city, especially one as expansive as 144 square miles. I've been in a lot of cities, and a gentleman I work with who's been in this work a lot longer than I have has seen, there isn't a city he hasn't seen, problem area of a city he hasn't seen in the States, I joke, but he's been to a lot of them. I took him to Detroit. He said, I've never seen this before. What was he talking about? In most cities where you have certain challenges, socioeconomic challenges, it's a bad sign if one out of six homes is unoccupied. That's a bad sign because it means you've got certain areas that that, that home could be a place where gangs end up hanging out. It becomes, you don't like that. There are areas in Detroit where one out of six homes actually has people in it. 
and there are whole areas where there's just uh, literally emptied homes. There's a reason they film apocalyptic movies in Detroit, right? Because it's just devastating. There's just no people. So an economist steps into this. A bright economist wants to do good and, and is smart and steps into this and says, well, and a lot of economists said this. One of the things we need to do to help Detroit is we need to get these scattered populations. We've got neighborhoods that are 20% populated. They cannot support business. They do not purchase enough. And the city is too big to run lights and make sure everything's working in these areas. So how do we get, we, it, we can't build an infrastructure in this place. So what we need to do is bring these populations all into a center area in Detroit so we can have enough population density to support stores, industry, restaurants, et cetera. Perfectly rational thing to say. Maybe the right thing to do, who knows. But if you're looking at it through the lens of Catholic social teaching, there's some other questions you want to ask. You don't simply ask that question. You say, that could be, but let me just raise some other questions. And I'm not answering the problem, but these are, these are real difficult questions. But one of the things you observe is that some of these people have been in those neighborhoods for three and four generations. They still attend one of the last institutions in those neighborhoods, which is probably a church. One of the last things standing. It's a church and maybe a corner liquor store, but it's a church. And you're going you're gonna to rip them up from this area, tell them where they've lived and their whole family's lived in their whole history, you're just going to rip them up and move them because it makes economic sense. And all you want to say, if you're viewing them out of their human dignity and as part of a community, you want to say, I don't, we don't want to go there too quickly. We want to ask the question whether that's the best thing. It may be. But we're going to take a particular view of this question that goes beyond just technologically solving this problem, whether that's technologically through the use of technology or just instrumentally through economic knowledge. Somehow, we want to raise the question that human communities matter, their church community matters, and their freedom to choose to move matters. Somehow, they should participate in this decision. It's part of their dignity. So that's what I mean by the church taking a particular lens to questions that don't always make it into policy discussions uh, when social scientists are in there as well. We need them both. We need all these views. But the church is always going to ask, what does this do for their dignity, and what does this do for human community? Cardinal Francis George of Chicago used to put it simply, God rest his soul, once said simply, said, you want to know what the church thinks about something? Ask what it does to the family. Start there, and you're likely to know what the bishops are going to say about something what the church is going to think about it, because it's communities and human beings with dignity. And once you get that, I think we can begin to see this is Fran Pope Francis's lens. This is how he's approaching questions that approach him, that he encounters. The other piece to Pope Francis's lens, and then we're going to jump into this narrative, is that Pope Francis has said numerous times that he doesn't want discussions about social challenges to remain at the level of just discussion. He wants it turned into action. And so you'll hear him time and time again, if you pay attention to his speeches, if you read Laudato Si, if you read Evangelii Gaudium, these documents he's produced, he's always pushing action. Go do something. There's a side of Pope Francis that is sort of frustrated with hearing people talk about things and not actually doing it. And so He's concerned about things remaining in an ethereal level of conversation, although he respects that conversation, knows it well, and is a smart man. But he wants to see people do something. And so his whole vision is to take this vision of the human person and community and get people to act on it. And that's the story I want to tell you. The first thing then to understand is what does Pope Francis diagnose as the challenge? What does he call, what does he mean by the, the problem? And this is where he gives these phrases. Culture of exclusion, throwaway culture, culture of transaction. These are kind of some of the terms he's used that have sort of caught on. What does he mean by that? I want to read to you a speech he gave, a piece of a speech he gave, uh, shortly after um, he became pope. After he became pope, one of the things he did when he was archbishop uh, in Argentina was he would, and if you know Latin America, one of the expressions of Catholic life of Christian life in Latin America, but Catholic life in particular in Latin America, are processions. Processions are big people, these public devotional moments. So one of the big devotional moments in Argentina was the Feast of St. Cajetan. And on the Feast of St. Cajetan, they had the relics of St. Cajetan, 
in, um, I believe, in the cathedral, and tens of thousands of people would spend a full day, probably took 10 or 11 hours to make the full procession, walking through the streets of Buenos Aires and coming to the cathedral, and they'd end, and Pope Francis would give a, a short speech at the end. And this was the first one that happened after he became pope. And he wasn't there for it, but they Skyped him in. He was on a big screen. And he gave a speech. And it's one of the first places where he uses culture of encounter as pope. He used it a lot as archbishop, but he used it as pope. And he challenged the people in the room. And he said to them this in the room, watching on the screen in the cathedral. He said to them, and you, you can picture, by the way, if you picture one of these processions, um, there's a lot of people with serious needs, right? And they know that there's going to be a big Catholic display of devotion, and so they're lining the streets asking for things on the side. So if you're walking, you're passing people asking you for money, right? Or some sort of help. And so you just picture that. And they get to the end of it, and Pope Francis says to them, so as you were walking here, and someone asked you for something to the side. Did you look them in the eye? Did you touch them? Or did you just toss them some coins? Because if you did not look them in the eye and you did not touch them, you have not encountered them. You have not encountered them. You have just tossed them some charity. And then he corrects them. He says, this is not the way forward. We cannot build a culture of encounter unless we look people in the eye, touch their hands, and meet them. That's the challenge, to do this. Why? Because he says we live in a culture of exclusion. Here's a speech from World Youth Day. Remember when his first, this is from his first World Youth Day. One of the first things he did is he spoke to the Brazilian bishops. And he diagnosed the challenge that he wants this that he wants to address. This is in 2007, I mean 2013. Please bear with me on this. He says, a relentless process of globalization and often uncontrolled process of urbanization have promised great things. Many people have been captivated, captivated by the potential of globalization, which of course does contain some positive elements. But many also completely overlook its darker side. And here's the sort of Francis diagnosis. Here's speaking to his brother bishops. Here's a Francis diagnosis, the darker side. And here's his litany. The loss of a sense of life's meaning, personal dissolution, a loss of the experience of belonging to any nest whatsoever, subtle but relentless violence, the inner fragmentation and breakup of families, Loneliness and abandonment, divisions, the inability to love, to forgive, to understand, the inner poison which makes life a hell, the need for affection because of feelings of inadequacy and unhappiness, the failed attempt to find an answer in drugs, alcohol, and sex, which only become further prisons, the great sense of abandonment and solitude of not even belonging to oneself, what a great line, of not even belonging to oneself, which often results from this situation is too painful to hide. I find it interesting that at different points, Pope Benedict XVI and Mother Teresa both made the following statement. The greatest poverty in the world is isolation. Isolation, to be alone, to be cut off from human community to be thrown away, to be discarded, to be marginalized, to be excluded. Uh, M Mother Teresa gave a famous prayer breakfast speech in 1994. She came to the National Prayer Breakfast and she spoke. People remember it very well, I think, for different reasons. There's a piece of it that doesn't always get mentioned, but I thought was extremely powerful. It was one of her first visits to the States where she was able to see some of the homes that her sisters ran, particularly for the elderly. And so she went to one of these homes. Now remember, Mother Teresa's coming from India, one of the Calcutta, where they have hardly any resources. Things are pretty rough. They're always just looking for basic things to care for the people who they're picking up off the streets, literally, and helping to die with dignity. She comes to the States and she says she went to visit one of her sisters, one of their sisters' homes, and she was amazed. It was clean, 
if you walk in the front room, there's the couches are there, the chairs, there's televisions, there's a bulletin board with things to do on it. Um, people are smiling, there's plenty to eat. There's the welcome desk. We've all been into homes like this. We know what they look like. And she said, she, first she was just overwhelmed. They have everything. It's such a great place. They have everything they need. And then she said, you know, then I noticed that the people who were sitting in the front room weren't looking at the TV screen and they weren't talking with each other. They were facing the glass doors, the front doors. She said, so she turned to her sister and she asked, why? Why are they looking out there? And her sister said to her, because they're waiting for a son or daughter to walk through the door. Because they've been forgotten. And to be forgotten is the greatest poverty. Human beings excluded from human community are in great poverty. And there's something about a lot of things going on in our world that are creating more and more excluded people. And by the way, it is not just economic, although it's tied to that sometimes. There are excluded people walking on our city streets who are very middle class, making careers, who are extraordinarily lonely. You students on this campus, you know this. You're passing people who you know may look really happy on Facebook, may put up wonderful images of themselves, may every photo they take make it look like they're living a party, and they're absolutely alone. We've somehow created a culture in which you can be anonymous in the middle of a crowd. And to be forgotten, to be alone, this is a great poverty. This is a great sadness. To not be seen. When Pope Francis talks about the invisible ones, this is a phrase he talks about. If you've ever been to Latin America, the, the way a lot of these cities develop is people have been coming in from the countryside, depending on the country. But in countries that have had rough economic times, what happens is people come in from the countryside, they can no longer live off farming or whatever they've been doing, and they come to the cities hoping to get work. Well, the cities can't take them. So you basically have a center city where most of the commerce and that happens, and then you have rings that are increasingly excluded of people who are moving in. So that on the outer ring, you've got people who are living in roughly tents if they can do it. As you come in, you get a little bit more cardboard homes. You come in a little more, you got a few cinder blocks, maybe tin roofs, right? And you just keep moving in based on how long people are there. And everyone knows they're there, and they'll come into the city occasionally, but they're not seen. Nobody goes there, nobody pays attention to them. Tens of thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, who the rest of the city just doesn't see, doesn't even notice. They've been excluded. It's true in the States. It's true in the States. A uh, somewhat funny story. We started a program when I was running Catholic Charities. We started a program called Christ in the City. We spun it out of Catholic Charities, which eventually is where college students, maybe some of you know it, come and give a year of their life to do service where they actually live near where the homeless people tend to be in Denver, get to know them personally, see them every day, spend time with them. It's a wonderful program. If you haven't seen it, go see it. But one of the first things we did is we would take people through, uh, one of the first things you'd do if you came was a formerly homeless person who offered to help us would give a tour of the city from a homeless person's perspective and take us to all the places where there were homeless people. And they take the students around and then at the end they come back and they'd sit down and you'd sort of talk through the experience. And the story is told of one student in that first group who went around, and this student was from Chicago. And the student from Chicago went, took, the, took this person around Denver, came back and said, well, what was your experience? And this person said, wow, I, I'm blown away. I had no idea you had so many homeless people in Denver. We don't have them in Chicago. <laughs> now, it, in one sense, it's not our fault. We, the way we live right now is radically segregated. There are sociologists writing books on this, from the right and the left, y'all. So for those of you who are more scholarly inclined, Charles Murray on the right, Robert Putnam, Harvard sociologist on the left, completely disagree on what to do about things, but both acknowledge there are two Americas, increasingly. But there are a lot of people living in our cities, and frankly, they're in our parishes, and they're in our communities, and they're in our colleges, and our universities, who no one sees. They're invisible to us. We don't see them. We have no occasion to notice them. How many people drive to Denver every day and every other city in the United States drive through neighborhoods and that have no idea, no idea what life is like for people in certain areas that they pass through. 
where they're taking an offering. They're invisible. Robert Putnam, Harvard sociologist, he actually tells numerous stories like this. Hold, he goes and he studies various towns in which he looks at the way they develop. Towns that have experienced great economic boom, but have had a massive rising poor population in the midst of economic boom. And now the communities are so segregated they don't even know. They don't even know they exist. Massive percentage difference in poverty, literally separated by train tracks. And nobody knows what goes on on either side. They're invisible. They've been forgotten. And so Pope Francis says to us again and again, see them. Say no to a culture of exclusion. Look them in the eye. Touch them in the hand. Know they exist. A lot of charitable work, in, amazing charitable work in the United States. I'm telling you, it's, it's fantastic what goes on. Social services, charitable work, some heroic people in this field. But a lot of people don't even know it. They don't see it. And it's not, it's not to critique in a certain sense. I'm not making, it's not to point fingers. Because our lives have just been structured in a certain way. We just have no occasion to ever meet, to be in certain neighborhoods, to be at certain places, to understand certain dynamics. We just don't know. And what happens when you're excluded to a lot of people is they begin to meet this description that Pope Francis gives us. Lack of hope, not even knowing oneself, looking for some other way to deal with the pain. Uh, a gentleman who works for me, um, works in my office, Ralph, who's taught me a ton. It's been a pl pleasure to work with him. Ralph was asked to go down to Ferguson shortly after the violence in Ferguson. They, they wanted help. They knew Ralph's expert in these kinds of situations. And Ralph tells his story, and he gives me permission to tell it. He's there shortly afterwards. He's just walking the streets, just trying to get a feel for what's going on in the neighborhood. And he says he bumped into this young man, kind of literally kind of bumped into him. And he looks at this teenage kid, and youngish teenage kid who's looking at him, and he's uh, carrying a car battery. And Ralph's thinking, I'm suspecting you weren't just working on your car. I'm expecting that, you know, it probably came from a store or something like that. And he says to this young man, he says, um, you know, I just got to ask you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, you, you are you're going to get caught. You're going to get convicted. You're going to have a felony on your record. You're not going to be able to finish school. You'll never be employable with a felony on your record. You're never going to have any of those opportunities because of this. He said, the kid looked back at him and said, I already don't have any of those things. I already don't have any of those things. There is a large, very large percentage of people in our world, it's global, but also in our backyards, who are invisible to us. And so Pope Francis' first challenge is to help us to see it. And to see it not just with their own eyes. I think that does take a little bit of adventuresses, and we really do need to go see. But to also to try and understand some dynamics. I'd like to recommend to you, a f it's on YouTube, a fantastic lecture by a, a just a superb philosopher, pr the preeminent ethical philosopher, certainly the preeminent Catholic ethical philosopher, but maybe just the preeminent ethical philosopher, a guy named Alistair McIntyre uh, at Notre Dame. He gave a beautiful, it was 2014, he gave a talk in, at Notre Dame called Heedlessness. Heedlessness, not paying heed to something. At the beginning he said, there are certain questions that confront us every day and that cause us to pause and think for a moment, largely because they're on television. Questions maybe about war, war in the Middle East, questions about terrorism, questions about tragedy, planes going down. He says, but there's another set of questions to which we do not pay heed. And he says, perhaps it's not because we don't actually pay attention, but because we don't want to pay attention. He says, for example, when we go into a grocery store stockpiled with inexpensive food, too many decisions to make, frankly. I hate shopping. It's oppressive. My wife sends me with coupons. I can't match them. I know if I don't use the coupon, I'm in trouble, you know. And there's too many choices. I don't know the difference, right? Um, and it happens to be across the street from another supermarket, by the way. The other one's kitty corner to it, right? 
when we walk in, do we ask the question, how is it possible that there can be this amazing variety of high quality food for such a low cost, that it's so affordable? How can this be? And there are a lot of complicated answers to that, and it's a very sophisticated question. But part of the answer, Alistair McIntyre says, and this is simply true, part of the answer is that the people who actually pick the produce and put it out there, 30% of the people working full time in that industry are below the poverty line. Their average income is somewhere around $12,000 a year for a family. And they're raising families. And the question is, do we then ask the question, do we ever ask that question? How is this possible? Is there something else going on? Let me understand this. This is the other aspect of seeing a culture of exclusion. Do we see them? It was interesting. One more Cardinal Francis George story. He, when he was out in Washington State as a bishop, at one point, a lot of the farm workers came to see him. And they said, we want to talk to you. And I think they were thinking of forming a union, and they wanted to talk to him about it. It was something, some circumstance like that. If I got that wrong, I apologize. But they wanted to come talk to him. And he said, you know, I was expecting them to come in and say, work is hard. It's so hot. We work long hours. There's these things we have issues with, and so we want to do something about it. And so he met with them. He sat down with them. He said, the first thing he said, he said, well, what's going on? What's your challenge? You know the first thing they said to him? Bishop. They don't respect us. They don't treat us with dignity. They don't know we're there. That's a culture of exclusion. Before they complain about the heat and the hard working conditions and the pay, the first thing is they don't see us. And so what Pope Francis is saying, and you will see this time and time again, I pick up Laudato Si again. I know it's about the environment, but it's about a lot of things. I spent a lot of time in that document. Pick up Evangelii Gaudium, look at his speeches, particularly to popular movements, and he will say time and time again, you need to see the exclusion. Because once you see it, then maybe we can do something about it. Part two. So what do we do about it? He says the counter to a culture of exclusion is a culture of encounter. That's the way to counter the problem. In a culture of encounter, it's worth noting that in Spanish, the word encounter, encuentro, has a slightly different meaning. It has sort of a richer meaning than we tend to use in English. In English, an encounter can be sort of a chance thing, can be kind of quick, can be a little feisty. I had an encounter with someone, right? In Spanish, the word encuentro means something deeper. It means that somehow two people have some sort of connected on some level, even if it's brief. Um, I think of Cardinal John Henry Newman's line, cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart that somehow humanities have met, that people in their humanness have connected in a way. That's what he means by looking in the eye. That's what he means by touching in the hand. That's what he means by actually engaging someone. One of the most profound incidents of this in my own life came from a story that was told by the chaplain at Samaritan House down in Denver. The chaplain down at, uh, in Samaritan House at Denver tells his story from very early in his career. And he said he was pretty early in his career, and it goes something like this. He was... If you've ever been to Samaritan House, you know it's a big homeless shelter in downtown Denver. About 330 people sleep there a night, probably 40 to 60 of whom are children, probably average age of four. That's roughly sort of what you got going. You got women and children on one floor, men on another, and it's so it's sort of, my point is it's pretty complex. And it provides services and there's a lot going down there. And if you've ever been in a homeless shelter, if you've ever been in the mission, you know, make it a lot bigger, you realize these are, these are tricky and they're, they're, they have their own ecology, right? There's their own way they function. And you gotta have a lot of rules, you gotta make sure things are set. And every night you sort of lock the doors at a certain point and you just sort of lock down the doors. There's two people there sitting at the front desk and there's a blue bench there where everybody sits when they come in and they just sit there and they hope nothing goes wrong. And in the winter it's always full. It's always full. So you got a packed house, you probably got a few extra people sleeping where they shouldn't be, but don't say that. And you just get people around and you're going, okay. And he says he was describing one of those freezing cold, miserable Denver, Colorado sort of March nights, I guess. No, probably in January, but one of those miserable nights. And he said it was one of his first nights there and there was a, a new volunteer and him doing the whole thing. And sure enough, 2 o'clock in the morning. And he's thinking, oh no, not prepared for this. 
not in the manual, what do I do? He goes, he looks, someone's standing out there in this mi miserable weather. He's got to open the door, even though he's not supposed to. Opens the door, a person comes through the door, um, figures out it's a woman, eventually learns her name's Mary, and she's, she's wrapped up in all kinds of coats and scarves, and she's clearly been trying to make it on the street, trying to get through. So she looked like someone had been trying to get through the street, with the exception that when he looked down, he noticed she didn't have any shoes on. And so she'd been walking the streets for hours in this freezing cold night. Her feet were bloody and wet and the snow was melting on them. And he brings her in and he puts her on the blue bench and he starts said, he started going through the process of thinking through what do you do at this point, like any normal person <laughs> in a situation like this would probably start with, which is, okay, what hospitals are open? Who do I call? Do I open the room over there that has the clothing and it's supposed to stay locked and to get her some socks and shoes? I don't have any beds. There's nowhere to put her. What can he, so he said he's going through this, and he said while he was doing that, the volunteer who was with him got up, went into the other room, got a bowl, filled it with warm water, put a towel over his shoulder, came down, knelt in front of her, started washing her feet. That did not solve all Mary's problems. They never saw Mary again. They got her to the hospital, but it didn't solve all her problems. But you know, for one moment, I suspect Mary knew she had dignity. I suspect she knew she wasn't simply excluded. This is an encounter. This is what encuentro means. This is what Pope Francis means. Did you touch them? Or did you just toss them some coins? It's quite a biblical image, isn't it? Pope Francis' invitation in terms of action is vast. It has to do with globalization. It has to do with the environment. It has to do with a lot of things. But at its heart, it starts with us building a culture of encounter in our daily lives. It really does start there. Seeing and then encountering. Let me pull this into church social teaching for just a minute. There are four principles of Catholic social teaching, four foundational principles from which everything else comes. Human dignity, which we talked about, the common good, subsidiarity, and solidarity. I want to talk about that last one for a minute, solidarity, a word that was made popular by Lake Willis, at least in the States, because of the solidarity movement. Solidarity is a key word. Solidarity is used by papal teaching, and I'm stealing this from the best historian of papal teaching on Catholic social teaching out there. He said it's been used in four senses, solidarity, human solidarity. The first, we're all human beings, so we're somehow part of a family, that's solidarity. Second, we all share certain things like air and water. And so that links us together. We need to find a way to work with the basic needs we have. It says third kind of solidarity is a solidarity when we get together and do stuff. We create associations to get stuff done. Or to just enjoy life. Anything from a bowling league to a charity to a union to a company, a business, where you bring people together. He says, but there's a fourth level of solidarity. Genuine friendship. Genuine friendship. And I would argue that what Pope Francis is calling for in a culture of encounter is that we not just do nice things for people, but we actually forge friendships in places we would never do that, where we wouldn't ever run into people. It's not enough to just be of service. It's actually something deeper. It's forging genuine friendship, a friendship in which I care about your good. And I know you. This was the experiment behind Christ in the city. He wanted to see, actually create real relationships where people saw each other all day. And this is going on all over the country. I've since seen some amazing examples of this. The best programs that are dealing with the hardest challenges in the world all have genuine relationships running through them. And you know who, when I see people's lives touched and completely changed? Not when they do nice things, not when they do a service project, but when they actually get to know somebody. When they actually get to know something. I've stories of people, former CEOs of really, maybe not Fortune 500, but pretty close, whose whole lives have been transformed by getting to know people in an environment they would never expect. To build a culture of encounter. And I'd say, especially to some of you young folks in this room, you've got a little freedom. I know it doesn't feel like that, but believe me, you have more time in college than you'll ever have again. Trust me on that one. If I sound like your dad, I'm sorry. It's just true. And it's a cliche, but it's true. 
Um, take time to meet and really get to know people you'd never run into. It's so easy to only befriend people who we already like and to select from and are basically from the same background we are. Make the effort. And to the rest of us, Pope Francis says something else. He has a nice line. He says, Encuentro also starts in your home, it starts in your family. Are you, in fact, having a culture of encounter in your family? This is a deep challenge. I remember challenging me. I, I um, seven beautiful children, 19 to 5. Back when it was a little bit lower than that, back when it was like 15 to 1, life was chaos, right? I mean, life was hard. I'd get home from work, and if half the children had clothing on and, you know, and there was some food on the table, it was a good day, right? You're just going, oh, my goodness. Actually, my wife was way better than that, but I'd come in. I'd come home from a, a long day's work, and I'd turn into a bad Captain Von Trapp, right, <laughs> from Sunday Music. And I'd pull out my whistle because I'm just thinking, okay, it's 6.30. Bedtimes start in, you know, 47.2 minutes. <laughs> and there's a system, and there's going to be baths, and we've got to get rosary, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and we've got to do all these things. And so I just turn into, it, we just go military. And I start blowing my whistle. They start marching around, you know, singing, introduce, <laughs> Liesl, you know? <laughs> and because um, I don't remember their names, right? You, you take that one, you get that one, right? And I get going, and I just turn into pure business mode, and they're marching, and, that, and the whole time, what's in my mind? A bowl of ice cream. Because if I just get them all in bed, there's waiting for me a bowl of ice cream. And if it's the weekend, then a glass of wine, right? And I'm just thinking, this is the greatest thing in the world. So I'm blowing the whistle. I'm doing this. Well, inevitably, when you're doing this, all the parents in the room know this, you inevitably end up making a promise because you're just in the middle of doing something and a child asks you for something and you say yes and you weren't paying attention you said yes. And so your, your one-and-a-half-year-old comes up and says, Daddy, will you read me a book? And you say, yes, 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 but not now. Wait, wait, go take a shower for you. Do bath, blah, blah. So then there it is, you're inches away from the ice cream. And your daughter says, Daddy, you promised to read me a book. And your wife's right there, so you can't change your mind. <laughs> OK, let's pick a book. And I remember this, because the book was Maisie Bakes a Cake. This is a true story. So Maisie Bakes a Cake. I don't know why, but Maisie Bakes a Cake, she pulls this book out, and I'm like, really? Maisie Bakes a Cake, okay. And I looked at it, and at that night, that, that, that book felt about 567 pages long. <laughs> it was war and peace, right? <laughs> and, it, and it was so heavy, and I just thought, she can't possibly make a cake for this many pages. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you open that thing, and he's like, one day, Maisie wanted to make a cake. So she started to think about the ingredients. And I'm like, we're going to have an ingredient a page. My wife leaves the room. I go, she made it. It was delicious. Done. Off to bed. <laughs> I'll never have that five minutes with my daughter ever again. Never. Five minutes. I could have read a book with my daughter. And I want a bowl of ice cream. Encounter starts in the family. There's some folks who serve Mother Teresa. It's a typical kind of answer she'd give. They'd say to her things like, Mother, what can I do? I want to make a difference. What can I do? And often what she'd say to them is, go home and love your family. Start with the people closest to you. You build a culture of encounter there, and I promise you it will spread. Not because I'm great at it, but because others are. And I've seen them, and I've met them. And they do it in amazing ways. Don't waste a minute of your life with another human being. C.S. Lewis once said, you never meet an ordinary human being. There's no such thing as an ordinary human being. Every person you meet is an immortal soul who's destined for a glory beyond imagining or an eternal tragedy. They'll outlast the moon and the stars and the mountains. Every single human being you encounter is of more worth than the whole natural world. Never waste a minute. Don't waste five minutes. This is the challenge Pope Francis issues. Because if we can build a culture of encounter there, it will, in fact, impact everything else we do. Part three. So what's it take? Well, Pope Francis is very clear. It takes us becoming different kinds of people. 
and the term he tends to use is called missionary disciples when he's speaking about Christians. It's a term that's used a lot in Latin America. It's a term that's used in a lot of the documents of the bishops of Latin America. You've perhaps heard of one document called the Aparecida document that he was a, a key author of and he took a lot from there. He says, we need to become a different kind of person in order to love like this, in order to actually be able to build a culture of encounter. And it contains a number of pieces. And I just want to walk through some of the things he teaches in different places. Number one, in order to have become people who can build a culture of encounter, we need to have an encounter first with God, with Jesus. It starts with our own encounter. We need to know love. We need to know eternal love. We need to experience eternal love. If you look at Evangelii Gaudium, his first long statement, apostolic exhortation, the first thing it says right off the bat, I wish that everyone would have an encounter with God, a personal encounter with God regularly and often. Know you're loved. Know you're loved infinitely. Know you're loved in spite of your faults. Know the mercy of God, as well as his delight in you. Know all these things. Know that. Have that encounter yourself. Second, encounter the face of Christ in others. Encounter the face of Christ in others. This is very, very old teaching. This is Matthew 25. This is the early fathers of the church, for you Catholics out there. This is St. Basil, who gave a famous homily, in which he said, as bishop, he's preaching, he's talking about the altar here, the Catholic altar, and he's saying, when you come up here, you reverence this altar. You show reverence to this altar, and you're right to do it because God himself comes down on this altar. And then you walk out in the street, and there's God himself in the face of your neighbor or in this person in poverty over here, and you walk right by them. You ignore God in there. You need to reverence God there the way you reverence him here. Mother Teresa made sure her nuns did adoration, beginning and end of every day. She saw it as completely seamless with picking up Christ in the poor. And by the way, she meant that. That wasn't just some nice saying, some neat thing. She really meant that. She saw something no one else could see. She saw the face of God in the distressing disguise of the poor. She really did. And they knew it. People knew it. The simplest thing she did for them. She was different. Mother Teresa had that kind of potency that comes from this kind of love. She could say the simplest things, and people would just, their lives would change, and she'd, people would start tearing up. The kind of things that if you or I said, people would be like, yeah, and? She could say things like, Jesus loves you, and people's lives are changed. We say that, and it's like, really, that's all you got? You got something more? Because of something going on in her own encounter with God and her ability to see them, people always felt seen. You know, they say this about saintly men and women. When you meet them, you feel like you're the only person in the room. This is a common thing. You feel like just for that brief moment, even if it's a 10-second, 20-second, 30-second, one-minute engagement, for that moment, you feel like you're the only person who exists right now for that person that kind of attentiveness, because they're seeing something. So we encounter Christ personally. We pray. We encounter him in one another. Next, we open our eyes intellectually. This is Pope Benedict. This is Pope Francis. This is John Paul II. This goes all the way back, particularly to John XXIII, who was doing some things in his encyclical Pacham and Terrace that are just really quite amazing. He's saying we actually need to be able to understand some basic things about human development, about social life, about Catholic social teaching. This means knowing something of teaching and theology and philosophy. This means knowing something of sociology, a little bit, just enough, and the dynamics of communities. These are things we actually want to see. There are a lot of good-hearted people out there who don't quite know what to do and would love to help. Well, the good news is there's all kinds of smart thinking about these things at the sociological level and at the theoretical and theological level, all kinds of things. And I would encourage you to do things like read. Um, and by the way, the USCCB website has all kinds of links and short explanations of terms and that kind of thing. There's wonderful organizations out there that are doing amazing work. Catholic Relief Services Overseas is considered expert of all overseas organizations in certain fields in human development. They're expert at it. They know exactly what it takes to go into a given village and do this and set things right. They know which pieces need to be in order. It's worth saying a lot of this work is very complex. 
but some understanding of it, both at the sociological level and in terms of Catholic social teaching. Find your way to a papal encyclical or a summary of one. You need to form your mind. That's part of the reality of these challenges. To see, we need to understand a few things. It's worth understanding how goods work. Why are there, why are there whole centers of cities where there is no, is no grocery store? They're called food deserts. You cannot get food in whole sections of cities. There are parts of cities where kids there have probably never had a meal that hasn't been out of a plastic wrapper. That's not an exaggeration. That's just really true. They have no access. They've got no way to get around. There are no buses running. They can't get to stores. And to try going grocery shopping for a family and have to carry it home on a bus. Why? These are questions we should ask. They're questions. It doesn't mean we're going to devote our life to it. Maybe you are. I hope some of you do. If you do, give me a call. I'll hook you up with some people. But these are things we ought to understand. We want to open our eyes and see them and be able to comprehend them. There's all kinds of resources on that. Fourth thing Pope Francis says. This one's a little bit brutal. I'm going to read it because I just feel less guilty when I tell other people this, and they have to hear it too. He says, in order to truly encounter people who suffer particularly from material circumstances that are difficult, he writes the following. This is, um, uh, this quote, I believe, comes from his World Day of Peace message a year ago, 2014. He says, Finally, there is yet another form of promoting fraternity, solidarity, friendship, what we've been talking about, encounter, and thus defeating poverty. And this must be the basis of all others. Okay, here we go. Here's the formula. Ready? It is the detachment of those who choose to live a sober and essential lifestyle, of those who, by sharing their own wealth, thus manage to experience fraternal communion with others. This is fundamental for following Jesus Christ and being truly Christian. Good, I think, to myself, reading this far. I'm glad those priests better start living more simply. And those religious people better start living more simply. I'm glad for them. This is good. I wish they read this. Then he goes on. It is not only the case of consecrated persons who profess the vow of poverty, but also of the many families and responsible citizens who firmly believe that it is their fraternal friendship with their neighbors which constitutes their most precious good. An amazing line. What does it take to transform our minds to actually say, you know, actually fraternal relationship with others that actually costs me, not just time but materially, is my greatest good. A genuine detachment. We live in a country, we got a lot of stuff. We have a lot of stuff in our lives. And it's worth asking ourselves the question, do I need it all? Do I need it all? A lot of talk about Pope Francis. Everyone has their theory about why he's liked and known, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I can say is pretty generic, no matter where I go around the country, one thing people admire about him is living simply. It gives him so much credibility. So much credibility. Is it the most important thing about him? Probably not. There's probably depths to his character and life that we'll never see. But you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing witness. It's an amazing witness. And it's a challenge to us to live detachment. Final point, and this one I'm going to take from Benedict XVI, on what it takes to be a missionary disciple. And the simple point is this, if I can find it, there it is. It takes suffering. It takes being willing to be uncomfortable. Here's what Benedict writes. This is from his encyclical, Hope Saves, Space Salvi. Quote, love simply cannot exist without the painful renunciation of self, for otherwise it becomes pure selfishness and therefore ceases to be love. To suffer with the other and for others, to suffer for the sake of truth and justice, to suffer out of love and in order to become a person who truly loves, these are fundamental elements of humanity. It is when we attempt to avoid suffering by withdrawing from anything that might involve hurt, when we try to spare ourselves the effort and pain of pursuing truth, love, and goodness, 
that we drift into a life of emptiness in which there may be almost no pain, but the dark sensations of meaninglessness. I would propose, I would argue, that our culture, at least particularly in the States, has become expert at making us comfortable. At some point, it became impossible to actually do this, apparently, for human beings in the United States, to actually put down a window with your arm. It has to be a button. Pretty soon, it'll be, that'll be too much work, too. We'll just have to speak when the window goes down. Every, every environment we're in has an air conditioning. I'm not against comfort, but if we're not willing to suffer, we're not going to love. And I want to say this. Coming from D.C., I say this. I know it may sound crazy. But love actually is the greatest power in the universe. As Dante says in the Paradiso, God's love moves the stars. That isn't just poetry. We actually believe the most potent force in the universe is love, that it actually conquers death. I want to end with a story about a gentleman I knew, taught his son. I worked with him, a guy by the name of Tom Vanderwood in Virginia. This story went national, actually went international a couple years back. Tom Vanderwoody, pilot, pilot in Vietnam, came back. He was a pilot for one of the major airlines for many, many years. Committed Christian, went to mass every single day. Bunch of kids, a lot of sons, great athletes, by the way, real <laughs> good athletes. One of them is my son's coach now, and it's just, he idolizes him. Um, amazing guy. Well, he bought a bunch of land out in Virginia in Manassas because he wanted somebody to have his sons and all his family share this land for him. Well, one of his sons, Josie, is Down syndrome. And so to see Tom Vanderwoody, the father, was to see Josie. They were always together. They were like this, best friends, okay? And wherever they went, they went together. Whatever they worked on the farm, they did together. Whatever they, you'd see him, you'd see him at church, you'd see him anywhere, there was, Tom and Josie, everyone. And Josie was a delightful kid, wonderful kid. He is a delightful kid. One day they're working on the farm. Josie at this point is about 20 years old, working on the farm together. Josie falls through a broken top to a septic tank. The septic tank is about eight foot deep of human refuse. Josie falls in, he can't swim. And if you've ever had a septic in you, I have. He can't get down in him. It's, and he's down there and he's panicking. His mother, wife sees it from the back of the house. Dad yells, call for help, tries to get his son. I can't get his son. I can't get his son to grab him that. So he jumps in, gets down, trying to hold his son up in there. And he realizes his son is struggling too much and he's suffering and he can't do it. He can't hold him up and himself up at the same time. So he makes a decision to go to the bottom of the tank to stand and hold his son above his head. Fifteen minutes later, help arrives. They pull Josie out. They pull Tom out. And Tom dies. It was, a, it was a tragedy. For the people who knew him, one of the common things they said about him was, of course that's what Tom did. For a human being, frankly, who a lot of people, to save a human being, a Down syndrome guy, to a human being who a lot of people wouldn't value, who wouldn't think should be born some. And he held him up above his head. And everyone around him said, of course that's what he did. It was about a, two months after this story. A friend of mine I was living here when it happened. A friend of mine comes and says, I was in Spain, and the priest in Spain gave a homily on Tom Vanderwood. That story went all around the world. It made it into all this press, not just the religious press, the secular press. You can look it up. You type it in, you'll find it on the major. Washington Post, I think, covered it all. These kinds of things change the world. They really do. And I know sometimes we think everything's about elections, everything's about the next policy position, everything's, and these things matter, and I wouldn't be devoting my life to what I do if I didn't think they matter. But at the end of the day, a culture built on love, loving friendship, a genuine inquisitor, is the power that can change the world. Thanks. Appreciate the time.